um, on the shippers YouTube. So um, the video of the recording will be available on the shippers YouTube. Um, if anyone wasn't able to come, uh, you could share that link. Um, so hi, everyone. Welcome to the Undergraduate Philosophy Club's panel on dehumanization. I would like to thank you all on behalf of the club for coming out today. I know that everyone's schedules are very busy, especially for virtual events during COVID. So we really appreciate you all coming. Um, we're so fortunate to have undergraduate students, Ethan Fiber and Sebastian Misinich and MA student Sam Thomas with us this afternoon to share their expertise on this topic. Um, if you have any questions during the event, please feel free to use the Q&A feature. And at the end, there will be um, the time when they will come and ask all the questions. So um, now I would like to welcome Sam to begin his presentation. Thank you. Uh, hello. Uh, I have a PowerPoint, so I'll be sharing that. Everyone can see this, correct? Oh, everyone else is muted, so hopefully um, I'm correct in that everyone can see this because now I can't hear anyone. Um, so uh, my, I'm going to start a stopwatch. I don't go over time. Um, my paper was titled uh, The Incoherence of the Political Dehumanization in the Work of Carl Schmitt. And it's structured a bit strangely. So the main question is that uh, dehumanizing others is obviously morally atrocious as an act, but the question is whether it's incoherent as well. And uh, I argue that while the paper that I'm building on, uh, David Livington Smith Paradoxes of Dehumanization is correct in that uh, conceiving of others as subhuman creatures or subhuman animals leads to contradiction in thought the treatment of others as mere objects also leads to such a contradiction. Uh, but then I ask a further question, which is that would the incoherence inherent in the act in dehumanization render political thought based on such dehumanization incoherent as well? And I uh, answer and, and argue that such is the case in the political thought of Carl Schmitt. Um, so given that it's based on uh, David Livingston Smith's paper, it'd be a good idea to give a brief overview of his argument. Um, so if someone dehumanizes someone else by treating him as a subhuman animal, uh, Smith's claim is that the dehumanizer is incoherent. Um, and the reason for this is that you can view someone as a subhuman animal, uh, but the dehumanizer displays what are called reactive attitudes to the dehumanized. Uh, these are uh, reactive attitudes are reactions to the quality of others' wills towards us as manifested in their behavior. And that definition comes from uh, P. F. Strassen, who popularized the term uh, and the concept. So these types of attitudes are displayed to others' wills towards us, but um, they're not really attributed to subhuman animals. It's inappropriate to target uh, resentment on this view toward a subhuman animal. Uh, but the dehumanizers uh, generally, as just a matter of fact, tend to attribute these types of reactive attitudes and as, as well as moral agency to the dehumanized. So thereby, this implicitly acknowledges the humanity of the dehumanized. Um, so the, the paradox is that uh, the, the dehumanizer claims to view the dehumanized as a subhuman animal, but in his treatment of the dehumanized implicitly acknowledges the dehumanized humanity. Uh, and the reason for this, according to Smith, is that the uh, incoherence occurs due to what's called unheimlichkeit, which literally just means unhome likeness, but it's more often translated as uncanniness, uh, which stems from the transgression of the natural kind division that the dehumanizer uses to categorize the dehumanized. So if the dehumanizer categorizes a certain group of people as parasites or rats or some other uh, subhuman creature, uh, he's, he's sort of attributing to them a certain natural kind, but they still look and act human um, so they're sort of transgressing this boundary. Uh, and that causes the sense of unheimlichkeit because the dehumanizer is pulled both to recognize the dehumanized as a human because of the appearances and to deny the humanity of the dehumanized because of their um, willingness to dehumanize. Uh, but there are also other ways in which someone can dehumanize another person. Uh, and I focus on two, um, denying the subjectivity, individuality, agency or distinctly human attributes of others and conceiving of others as inanimate objects. Uh, the latter I call objectification and claim that it's paradoxical because it still involves the attribution of moral agency. Um, as previously mentioned, just as a matter of fact, the uh, 
dehumanizers tend to attribute moral agency and reactive attitudes towards the dehumanized, even if they're considered mere objects. Uh, but there's also self-objectification, which is the treatment of oneself as an object. An example of this comes from Ernst Jünger's um, essay on pain, where he advocates that in order to master pain, uh, people should treat their own bodies as objects to be sort of sacrificed in, in pursuit of uh, some sort of higher purpose. Uh, but this is incoherent because it would involve willing oneself to become an object. Uh, but that's incoherent because objects by definition lack a will. So you're willing to get rid of your own will, which is a very strange and self-undermining pursuit. Uh, similarly, you can deny someone else's agency or deny your own agency. Uh, and the latter phenomenon I call abnegation. Um, but denying others agency is paradoxical for reasons like objectification, because people deny the agency of the person they're dehumanizing. But still, again, as a matter of fact, um, Smith holds that uh, there's a vast empirical support for this claim that people attribute reactive attitudes to the dehumanized, and they attribute moral agency to the dehumanized. But again, those concepts would be inappropriately placed if the dehumanized really did lack agency. So again, there's this uh, tension going on. And abnegation is paradoxical for a reason like self-objectification because it involves willing oneself to deny one's agency. But willing autonomously is something that ne necessitates agency. So again, much like self-objectification, you're willing yourself to deny your own will. So, uh, and you're, you're giving up your agency uh, using your agency. So again, it's self-undermining and self-defeating. Uh, and this brings us to the work of Carl Schmitt, who was uh, sometimes called the philosophical godfather of Nazism. He was an unrepentant member of the National Socialist German Workers' Party. So it's not a uh, false label. He uh, has two main concepts that I wish to draw upon here. And the first is the concept of the political. Uh, and Schmitt conceives of as the political as the essence of politics. And much like how the ethical, as a study, uh, deals with the distinction between good and evil, the political, uh, as a subject, deals with the distinction between friend and enemy. And friend and enemy are technical terms in uh, Schmidt's work. Uh, you may even like the person who you consider to be your enemy. The enemy is simply a social enemy, uh, or someone who's perceived as a member of a group that's an existential threat to your way of life. And again, this is perceived existential risk, and it need not spill over into violence or war or dehumanization. But the political division must always carry the possibility of becoming violent because of otherwise it would not be perceived as an existential threat. Uh, and there's a second concept in Schmidt's work and another work of his called political theology uh, in which he, he lays out the conception of sovereignty. Uh, Basically, according to Schmidt, no law or set of laws can possibly govern every single state of affairs. So there will inevitably be, be instances in which someone must decide what to do because the law doesn't prescribe what to do. You have to uh, sort of decide what the precedent is going forward because there's no previous precedent or law to draw upon. And these states of affairs are called states of exception. And the person who decides on whether a given state of affairs is a state of exception or what to do in a given state of exception is the sovereign. And for Schmidt, the law gains its force because of the sovereign. And so the question of sovereignty is ever present. Uh, and the reason why the sovereign is, uh, the question of sovereignty is ever present is because there's no way in which you can foresee these states of exception coming. By necessity, uh, sort of implicit in the concept of exception is the fact that no previous law or set of laws has foreseen it or uh, accounted for it. And furthermore, uh, Schmidt draws upon a lot of Catholic reactionary thinkers to argue that a sovereign is necessary because humanity is naturally evil and thus in need of someone to rule over it to prevent its worst impulses from coming to, to bear. Uh, and so I'm going now from Schmidt uh, back to Smith or from Smith to Schmidt uh, and arguing that Schmidt's political philosophy is incoherent. Uh, so the ever-present possibility of dehumanization inherent in the concept of the enemy may lead to a diachronic in incoherence, which is to say uh, your set of beliefs now is in, uh, uh, in conflict with your previously held set of beliefs. Uh, for example, one who was formerly regarded as a human may become dehumanized. So you now view this person as less than human or, or uh, lacking agency, whereas if you 
previously viewed him as fully human. Uh, but there's also a possibility for synchronic incoherence. That is, your beliefs at, at a given time are in, uh, incompatible with other beliefs you hold. Uh, because the enemy is not this intimate enemy whom you personally despise, but uh, what's hostis, uh, sort of a social enemy or a member of a group whom you view as the existential threat, you may be friends with someone on a personal level, but you, you can also dehumanize him um, insofar as you view him as part of a larger social enemy uh, politically. So you're, you know, in your personal life, you're viewing him as fully human, but then also in, in your social life, you, your political life, you view him as merely a part of an impersonal social mass, which is uh, sort of an existential threat to your way of life and has to be dealt with as if they were an object. Uh, and sovereignty is incoherent for reasons like those of self-objectification and abnegation, because submission to the sovereign is presented as an autonomous action that the subject undertakes, but because the sovereign grounds the law, there's nothing braining in the sovereign. The sovereign gives the law its force and the, uh, rather than the other way around, so submission to the sovereign isn't submitting to the universalizable laws that can be used for determining agency, but rather to the mere whims of the sovereign. Uh, but this is defective as autonomous action, uh, according to Christine Korsgaard, who argues that the reason why it's defective is that you're repeatedly deferring how to act uh, simply according to the whims of another person rather than a sort of set of guidelines that you've chosen to guide your actions. Um, it's arbitrary also because you're simply giving up um, to whatever whim the sovereign wants you to, to act upon. So it's defective both because it's arbitrary and also because it's not really you who's uh, acting. So sort of in summary, dehumanizing others, whether via objectification or denial of others' agency is incoherent because it still involves the attribution of third person reactive attitudes toward others. Um, and this type of dehumaniz dehumanization occurs when assigning the enemy, even if in your private life, you're on good terms with someone who's a member of the enemy group. Um, and dehumanizing oneself via self-objectification or abnegation is incoherent because one must use uniquely human attributes like willing or your agency to carry out those self-dehumanization. Uh, but this same problem appears when submitting to the sovereign because it simultaneously requires and lacks the same attributes necessary for autonomous action. Um, and there's a, there's a lot more, but I could not explain it uh, in four minutes, so I think I'll just end it there. Thank you so much, Sam. Um, if you have any questions or comments um, for Sam, please put them in the Q&A uh, feature and we'll address them at the end. Um, we'll now hear from Sebastian. All right, thank you. I also have a PowerPoint. I'll just share it real quick. All right, um, thank you. Uh, I am giving my presentation on kind of like an anti-humanist take on dehumanization. Um, I'm gonna start by talking about uh, humanism itself and what it is. So according to like Louis Althusser, um, humanism is an ideology that is a spontaneous relationship that we have with reality um, and according to humanism, like some of the core traits are you know, to be rational, to be autonomous, to be de uh, deserving of certain you know, good treatment um, in virtue of that shared humanity. And a crucial thing here is that like the human subject is usually contrasted with the determined subject of the social sciences. So like according to like uh, humanism, which is more of like an enlightenment, you know, enlightenment philosophy. Uh, Human, you, know, you would posit the human subject as being like, you know, yeah, rationally autonomous, can, can make decisions and, and everything. Versus social science kind of sees human human individuals as uh, somewhat determined by their like, you know, material conditions. Um, and and to go off that a little bit further, um, you know, even though humanism is an ideological construct, it still means it's like real, like it has like a real impact on like the material realm. Uh, in fact, Althusser argues that humanism's practical function is more important than its theoretical function because it structures our social relationships along its logic like it instantiates in us uh, 
the disposition to treat others like you know we have autonomy, like we um, are rational, or, or that we have this kind of moral egalitarian, uh, equal sort of common denominator, and um, that's important to know, I think. Uh, and and you can also kind of think to like Karl Marx talking about the base and superstructure, you know, and how to how like you know the, the ideologies and like the material economic base like interact. And there never really is like a last instance where one determines the other because they're always interacting in this like dialectical relationship. Uh oh, there we go. Um, and then um, uh, Sam talks about this a little bit, so I don't need to go as deep, but um, you know, dehumanization is kind of a, according to David Livingstone Smith, is a, is a psychological tactic that makes violent or degrading interpersonal conduct easier. And you know, very briefly, yet roughly, um, almost at the risk of caricaturing him, <laughs> yeah, just dehumanizers like misrepresent their enemies as like subhuman or as not human. And the the crucial part of the thesis is that we have an intrinsic kind of humanist disposition uh, psychologically, uh, which must be overridden in, in order to engage in such conduct. Like I said, Sam kind of talks about this. So there's some kinds of dehumanization that Smith talked about. Uh, just to kind of give you an idea of the paradigm are like you know fitting the offending person into more predictable metaphysical categories i think he gives the example of like a, a, a certain people you know if, if a baby has birth defects you know might assume it like, like a, has a has the essence of like a hippopotamus and like it returns it to the river um you know because that's like a more coherent like predictable category than um you know than you know, a, a, a malformed baby, uh, you can affirm mastery of the dehumanized person, you know, putting them in their proper metaphysical place as well. Uh, you can label them, you know, stigmatize them with like a stigmatizing representation as a danger to you know the social order, and you can like ritualistically cleanse the offending characteristics by incorporating them into like a community you know ritual. And I think he gives the example of like the witch hunt. I could be wrong, but I think that's the example he gives. But it's that idea of like, um, you know, they represent this, you know, evil, you know, non-human, scary thing, and um, you can kind of ritually cleanse that. And so I have a couple of problems with the dehumanization paradigm, and really this is like my most of this presentation is like my positive account of like anti-humanism. But uh, you know, a humanist predisposition is meaningless if we have the capacity to dehumanize others like there is no um reason to like give precedent or priority to like our an, an intrinsic humanist disposition if we have like an equal capacity to dehumanize so you know it kind of seems like they cancel each other out like you shouldn't prioritize one over the other um secondly subjectivity is actually necessary for violent or degrading conduct to be coherent because the autonomous individual has the capacity uh, both to harm and to help like just as we recognize spontaneously you know that in virtue of someone's you know autonomy that they can help us and we can have this good human interaction um, they also have the capability to harm like in, in that in fact like it's necessary for us to view someone as an enemy to know that they are autonomous that they can harm us um, and lastly you know the kind of frame dehumanization as a foreign contaminant of our innate humanism is an unconvincing appeal to human nature and uh, appeals to human nature have like classically done pretty poorly and um, you know I think that the, you know, you know, the humanism the dehumanization paradigm kind of falls to you know, prey to the same criticism like you know uh, there is no like universal abstract human essence that we all are different in virtue of our different social material situations I feel like a little bit further like you know humanism is an ideology in competition with other ideologies as all two Sebastian I'm sorry to cut you off but I think our audience is having difficulty hearing you um I just saw someone mention it in the chat so if, if you either wanted to move a little bit closer to your speaker um you or just now? speak a little yeah that's a little bit better okay. I'm sorry okay. I know you've gotten far but I just saw it Anyway, um, so yeah, humanism is an ideology in uh, competition with you know, other ideologies. Uh, thank you. <laughs> I think I was using this microphone, it wasn't working. Um, so under Althusser's rubric of ideology as an organic part of every social totality, 
um, you know, dehumanizing ideologies are just as organic and like functional in the strictest sense in society as is humanism. Um, and, uh, you know, an example would be like this propaganda poster from World War II saying that's like this Russian person is fighting for freedom. Like, you know, Americans maybe had like an intrinsic, you know, Russophobic uh, disposition at that time. And uh, to instantiate kind of like a pro-Russian uh, sentiment, then, you know, they, it, it, would be, it would be necessary to create political propaganda to induce that, you know? And so like, why it seems like the same logic could be applied the other way. Like maybe we have an intrinsic anti-Russian this position and you know we have to be we have to proselytize humanism right and that the reason is because that's true like humanism is just another ideology um in the uh, in this ideological ecosystem so um and there's a socially situated alternative um our dispositions towards others are determined by our social situation this is according to kate mann um and uh, karl marx also points this out like uh, as we jostle for our position on various like um, social hierarchies uh, by necessity through that competition, we cr create categories like friends and enemies uh, socially. Um, you know, our biases are instantiated by those like larger social structures, a priori of individual social interaction. So, um, you know, that means that yeah, we don't like make our individual choice or individual process of like, you know, I'm going to go out and dehumanize this person. Um, it's more of a uh, larger uh, social process that occurs in virtue of like our material situation before we even, um, you know, think about it almost. It's a spontaneous, I was like, going back to Alpe it's like, it's a spontaneous thing. And so some explanatory gains of the socially situated model, um, this is Andrew Pierce going off of. Um, so it recognizes the, the structural nature of oppression and violence, and it can account for the role of humanism itself in degrading and violent conduct. Because if we remember the Enlightenment, um, you know, the, the creation of the concept of, of being human uh, was used itself in order to exclude the vast majority of the world from that category. Like, you know, people in the global south, uh, people of color, women, um, were excluded from this, the club of humanity, basically. Um, and so humanism itself uh, can be accounted for in the socially situated model because the people thinking of the humanist ideology were people in like Western Europe during the time of the enlightenment. And, um, you know, that's one gain that it has. And, and another thing is that the false universality posed by humanism paints over real antagonisms in our society because it, it makes a big deal out of this common denominator, which is our shared species, um, which really doesn't have uh, like a, like a, it doesn't really have force. If it doesn't really have like a force, if one group of people has more power and has more mastery over others, you know, by virtue of yeah, the structure of our society. And then lastly, you know, I'm gonna apply it to like the Black Lives Matter movement, which I think is like a good, a good application. Um, so the political praxis of Black Lives Matter kind of demonstrates the poverty of like humanism and, and debates over the humanity of oppressed people. Because on the one hand, you have like approaches, philosophical approaches that kind of attempt to like argue and like win uh, marginalized people a spot in the club of humanity by po uh, pointing out the dominating groups, uh, inconsistent application of humanist ideals, which is like a rigged game. Uh, because, you know, the people who are in charge of society can, you know, ideologically determine the content of what it means to be human. And by contrast, the practice of hum movements like Black Lives Matter assumes the humanity of, in this case, Black people a priori, which renders those uh, philosophical discussions uh, pointless, because obviously Black people are humans, and by fighting for rights, uh, they are already assuming that they're part of this, this equal club of, of humanity, that like common denominator, and that they need to be materially realized like those, those rights. Um, and that's all I had. I'm sorry if y'all couldn't hear the beginning, but that's, the, that's it. That's it for me. Thank you, Sebastian. Uh, I think it was just a little bit low in the beginning, but um, I hope everyone was able to hear it. Um, now we will be hearing from Ethan. And again, if you have any questions, please feel free to use the Q&A feature. Thank you. 
Uh, hello. Let me just get this set up. Okay. So this is my presentation on uh, dehumanization in Xinjiang, uh, specifically covering the ongoing Uyghur genocide. So uh, kind of the aim of this work. Uh, so in the status quo, it's really no secret that China is kind of employing some oppressive domestic policy. Uh, some examples of this include their actions towards Tibet over the last 20 years. Uh, they've increased uh, crackdowns on security. They've increased crackdowns on dissidents. Uh, and this was also pretty uh, available seen in 2019 during the Hong Kong pro-democracy protest in which the Chinese government kind of came in uh, and kind of brutally repressed those protests and kind of you know locked up anyone who was supportive of them. So for this paper I specifically wanted to focus on Xinjiang which is home of the native uh, Muslim Uyghur people uh, and currently in the status quo the Uyghur people are suffering under brutally repressive measures indicative of what I believe to be dehumanization. Uh, but despite the magnitude of this atrocity, a lot of people seem to be generally unaware of the situation. Um, and because of this lack of awareness, uh, the purpose of this work was to kind of argue that the Uyghur people are being dehumanized and oppressed on a material level and a philosophical level, uh, specifically trying to ask the question of how a philosophical analysis of dehumanization might help us kind of context uh, contextualize and understand this tragedy. So in order to do this, we're first going to observe a psychological account of dehumanization uh, and a historical account of dehumanization and eugenics to kind of provide a foundational understanding of the phenomenon of dehumanization. Uh, and then I'm going to explain the situation in Xinjiang and apply these two accounts to kind of conclude that the Uyghurs are indeed uh, victims of dehumanization and genocide. So. Uh, for the psychological account of dehumanization, I used, uh, like Sebastian and Stam, David Livingstone Smith's Paradoxes of Dehumanization, uh, his 2016 work. And in that work, Smith kind of defines dehumanization uh, to mean to conceive of others as subhuman creatures. Uh, and though he says that there are other certain aspects that are accompanied with dehumanization, such as objectification, uh, he specifically chooses conceiving of others as subhuman creatures because he finds it's the most holistic determinant for dehumanization in that objectification may be present in certain times, but it's not necessarily sufficient to in, uh, indicate dehumanization is occurring while conceiving others as subhuman is. Um, and Smith kind of explains that when individuals dehumanize other individuals, they assign them this strange status of outwardly appearing and behaving like a human, but inwardly attributing them uh, to being subhuman and different. And Smith explains that this kind of contradictory position is really only possible because of certain metaphysical mental assumptions that kind of date back to the Enlightenment. And these assumptions are one, that it's possible to appear human and not be human. Two, that you have to possess a human essence to be human, so it's not enough to just appear human. Three, that there's a natural hierarchy in which humans outrank animals. Uh, four, to be subhuman means to have a subhuman essence. And five, that this natural hierarchy in which man is higher than animals is also a moral hierarchy. So anything below man, uh, man can essentially treat it however he wants because it's a, a moral hierarchy. Um, and Smith kind of explains that these assumptions manifest due to humans' propensity for something called psychological essentialism. And, and Smith explains that psychological essentialism is the general disposition of indi individuals to believe that the world is carved up into natural kinds, each of which is individuated by a unique immutable causal essence. Um, and Smith explains that this imagined essence is necessary and sufficient for making something a member of a natural kind, which kind of leads us to believe that natural kind membership is fixed by the features of a thing's internal constitution, not, it, not its outward appearance. So uh, when this psychological essentialism is kind of combined with the previously mentioned metaphysical assumptions, it becomes mentally possible to conceive that the essence of something can be separate from its appearance, uh, which then allows for individuals to be classified as appearing outwardly human and acting outwardly human, but inwardly possessing the essence of something else, uh, and in this instance, mainly a subhuman. So this kind of demonstrates how dehumanization is psychologically possible, uh, but it's important to understand why it occurs in the first place. So Smith explains that dehumanization kind of acts as a solution to, quote, the problem of ambivalence, uh, which he describes as when groups that are kind of unfamiliar to each other are really unsure with how they want to interact with each other or even evaluate other groups. And Smith uh, explains that kind of in this state, humans naturally possess inhibitions against killing other humans. Uh, and this is kind of seen in active combat zones. Soldiers will typically not shoot to kill unless they are in immediate danger. They will purposely misfire a lot of the time. Um, 
And this inhibition against violence kind of exists despite exploitation and subjugation being pretty profitable to the oppressor who is you know, doing the oppressing, it's giving them benefits. Uh, and Smith explains that dehumanization kind of acts as an override for these inhibitions against violence because it portrays other individuals who you know, are outwardly looking and acting human as inwardly dangerous and threatening, uh, kind of making violence a necessity, uh, necessary precaution in the mind of the dehumanizer. So Smith kind of lays out two specific forms of dehumanization that I think are importantly applicable to the situation that I, I will describe in a little bit. Um, so Smith explains that when people are dehumanized uh, in this manner, they are minimized morally, and they're kind of viewed by the dehumanizers as lacking intrinsic value and moral worth. But despite that, the dehumanizers can still see the dehumanized as lack uh, as being uh, having instrumental value, uh, specifically being capable of using uh, used for hard labor and services alone and kind of being valued just for that. And keeping that in mind, uh, the two forms of dehumanization that Smith kind of outlines that are useful to this uh, are demonizing dehumanization and enfeebling dehumanization. So under demonizing dehumanization, uh, the dehumanized are kind of seen as akin to an animal that's regarded as maybe threatening because of its predatory nature or maybe it's venomous or it carries disease or it's aggressive. Uh, and uh, this feeling is kind of exacerbated by uh, the uncanny that Sam mentioned, that feeling that it, it looks like something, but inside it's actually something else. Um, and under this conception, individuals are kind of rendered as monstrous or demonic. Uh, and then Smith also outlines enfeebling dehumanization, under which the dehumanized are viewed as akin to more livestock animals, uh, not physically dangerous, but more useful for tasks and manual labor. Um, but despite you know, not being viewed as necessarily dangerous, they still produce that feeling of uncanniness in that they, they are thought to resemble humans, but inwardly be something else. Uh, so moving on to a historical account of dehumanization and eugenics. Uh, so I looked at Robert A. Wilson's 2020 work, Dehumanization, Disability, and Eugenics. Um, and under that work, Wilson kind of explains that uh, the Nazi regime during its time in power kind of oversaw the extreme dehumanization of certain sorts of people, uh, such as Jewish people and people with disabilities uh, and gypsies, for example. Uh, and these people were the victims of systematic segregation, internment, sterilization, and murder. And Wilson kind of explains that on under this regime, the individuals were killed because they were deemed to be less than fully human and were compared to diseases and burdensome animals. So similar to Smith's account. And Wilson kind of explains that these killings were justified uh, and the, these, uh, you know, the sterilization and all these horrible things were justified as a protection from threats, not only protecting the current German people and the German government from threats, but also uh, justified because they were protecting the future from threats. So they saw this not only as uh, you know, necessary, but a justified step to protect the future. And Wilson kind of outlines that when it comes to eugenics in general, uh, to negatively value a eugenic trait enough to sufficiently justify uh, you know, compulsorily sex, uh, sexual sterilization is inherently dehumanizing to people who possess that trait. Um, and I think that's kind of obvious, but uh, Wilson explains that this is not only because of its lack of respect for bodily autonomy, but also because it negatively impacts uh, one's life in general. So now moving on to the situation in Xinjiang. So uh, the Uyghur people are a mostly Muslim Turkic ethnicity, uh, the majority of which live in Xinjiang, where they number about 11 million people. Um, and this region of China, Xinjiang, uh, is designated an autonomous zone by the Chinese Communist Party, uh, but in reality, it has little to no autonomy from the government. Uh, and this complete control has essentially allowed to the gradual stripping of rights and freedoms from the native Uyghur people uh, by the Chinese Communist Party. Uh, and over time, this has manifested itself through the prohibition of certain religious practices tied to Islam, uh, such as fasting, uh, increasingly intense surveillance, uh, including facial recognition software, and the destruction uh, of multiple religious sites. Uh, but this was kind of the beginning, uh, and these measures began to seriously escalate in 2014 uh, when the Chinese government began to build re-education camps uh, in Xinjiang. Um, now, as of 2020, uh, the Chinese government has corralled more than 1 million Uyghurs into these internment camps, uh, though some estimates range up to 3 million uh, individuals. Uh, and in these camps, the, the Uyghur people have been subjected to political indoctrination, forced sterilization, and torture. Um, 
And I particularly wanted to highlight uh, the Chinese government's treatment of uh, Uyghur women, uh, because the Chinese government in these camps and outside of these camps in the general area of Xinjiang has been regularly subjecting minority women to pregnancy treks, forced intrauterine devices, sterilization, and even abortion on hundreds of thousands of people. Uh, and th these kind of measures are supplemented by mass detention, both as a threat and as a punishment for kind of failure to comply. Um, with these standards. And very unfortunately and kind of tragically, this is having a, a noticeable effect. Uh, birth rates in the Uyghur regions of Hotan and Kashgar plunged by more than 60% from 2015 to 2018. And in Xinjiang, the province as a whole, birth rates continue to plummet, falling 24% in uh, 2019 compared to just 4.2% uh, nationwide. So there's a clear increase um, and it's kind of being stemmed uh, from this policy. And it, it, what's unfortunate is that many of these Uyghurs are unable to leave China, as China is, uh, has rarely given permission from Muslim minorities from Xinjiang to leave, and they also specifically never grant it to Uyghurs who are kind of, you know, a subsection of the general Muslim population there. So in terms of genocide and dehumanization, uh, in this situation, uh, I think it's it's fairly clear on a definitional level. So the UN official convention on genocide states that genocide means that any of the following acts are committed with intent to destroy in whole or part a national, ethnical, or racial or religious group. And one of those measures includes imposing measures to intended to prevent births within that group. So under this definition, I think it's clear that this situation constitutes genocide in terms of at least international law. Um, now, the Chinese, uh, Chinese Communist Party kind of weakly attempts to justify this treatment. Um, and they say that these actions are necessary to prevent terrorism, separatism, and religious extremism within the region abroad. Um, but this kind of falls apart when you look at one that the Chinese Communist Party has uh, most of the time purposely over-exaggerated the size and danger of these threats uh, to use this as a justification to put in more restrictive measures, uh, kind of without pushback. But second of all, uh, this kind of becomes more flimsy when you look at the fact that the Chinese government classifies practicing Islam and just practicing Islam alone to merit a sign of extremism. And they have used that justification for the arrest of many Uyghurs domestically. And those people have either been captured or they've been forced to flee the country. Um, and the true motivation behind this, as opposed to what the CCP kind of says on face, is to homogenize the Uyghurs into the country's Han Chinese majority, even if that means erasing their cultural and religious identity for good. Um, and moreover, it's important to note that there's a decent amount of evidence that the Uyghurs are also serving as a cheap labor source for the Chinese government. Uh, and there's evidence of forced labors by Uyghurs both inside and outside internment camps in places like cotton fields uh, and tomato uh, fields. So kind of connecting this atrocity to the accounts. So Smith's account kind of helps contextualize this horror. Um, so the CCP is economically benefiting from the subjugation and exploitation of the Uyghur people as evidenced by their forced labor. And this is something that generally would be refrained from unless inhibitions against violence are kind of overridden by dehumanization. And I think that's kind of clear in this case. Uh, the Uyghurs are painted by the Chinese Communist Party as dangerous, violent terrorists. Um, and the Chinese government uh, officials running these camps at the local level say, uh, and I quote, that they're goal is to eradicate from the mind thoughts about religious extremism and violent terrorism and to cure ideological diseases. Um, I think this very clearly serves as an example of demonizing dehumanization as laid out by Smith, uh, as these individuals are being, you know, uh, pointed out as akin to violent and dangerous, and they literally are, you know, their, their religion is being painted as an ideological disease. Um, but moreover, I think the Uyghur people are also subject to enfeebling dehumanization uh, because captured individuals are being utilized like livestock for their labor. And once they're kind of in these re-education camps and they've been captured, they're not characterized to be nearly as dangerous as, you know, individuals who are outside of these camps. Um, so I think this is clear that in the situation, the dehumanized are not being given their intrinsic value or moral worth. And they're really only being valued for their instrumental capacity to do labor. Um, and under Wilson's account, I think this also demonstrates dehumanization. So the Uyghurs are victims of systematic internment and sterilization by the Chinese Communist Party, who is framing it as necessary to protect itself from threats. Uh, this very similarly mirrors how the Nazis treated uh, their prisoners uh, and the people they tormented, and also the rationale for doing so being that this needs to be done to protect not only you know, the current base uh, of power, but also the future. 
Moreover, involuntary eugenic sterilization is something that's inherently dehumanizing, and we have pretty broad evidence that that's occurring in Xinjiang. Um, and finally, the CCP is kind of seeking to remove and assimilate an entire people, and these falling birth rates kind of show that this plan is working. Um, so given that we can see that there is dehumanization uh, shown on Smith's account and Wilson's account, what can we kind of take away from this? I think that we can take away that, that currently in the status quo, the Uyghurs are definitely subject to dehumanization, both on a uh, international law level and on a philosophical level uh, at the hands of the Chinese government. Uh, and given that, I think it's important to stay informed about atrocities and crises like this, uh, no matter how distant. Uh, and I also think it's important to inform other people about problems like this so that uh, when more people become aware of the situation, it allows for more discourse on the topic. And that discourse can potentially you know, translate into political pressure on governments or non-government groups to kind of take some sort of action on the problem, uh, such as condemnation, sanctions, or diplomatic pressure. And uh, luckily, this is kind of happening in the status quo, that, though not uh, as fast as I would like. Um, the recognition of the situation as a genocide by various governments has happened. America officially recognized it as a genocide. I believe the Canadian government and Dutch government recently did too. Um, there have been moves to ban certain products that are associated with forced Uyghur labor, and there's also been some more diplomatic pressure on the Chinese government. Um, but I think it's important to stay aware of the situation and kind of keep it in the back of your mind to tell others about it, because I, I think it's a, a modern genocide that needs to be addressed. Thank you, Ethan. Um, if anyone has any other questions, please feel free to put them in the Q&A. Um, and we are going to move on to the Q&A portion of the event. So I'm gonna hand it off to Jackson and Tim to ask some of the questions. Do you wanna go ahead and start, Jackson? Yeah, for sure. So the first question we have um, is from Cheyenne. She's uh, asking for a clarification about um, dehumanization and demonization. Um, she says that, I don't think dehumanizers see the dehumanized as objects without agency, but something that has an evil nature. For example, like if a snake were to eat a frog, you don't necessarily uh, blame the snake, but you just understand that it is part of its nature. And she, um, parallelize this to how demonizers see their targets as snakes and not necessarily as agentless robots. So they do have autonomy, but they are perceived as evil. And um, <clears throat> um, she specifically addresses this to uh, Sam, our first presenter, was um, asked while he was presenting, um, asking, is it still incoherent if dehumanization is replaced with demonization? I think so. Um, I should note, and Ethan pointed this out, that Smith considers uh, demonizing dehumanization to be a subtype of dehumanization. Um, so the examples uh, are comparing people to predators like bears or tigers or lions. You know, um, and the reason why it's incoherent is that uh, the type of uh, thing you're attributing to bears or lions or tigers or what have you when they, you know, uh, eat food that they, you know, kill an animal for is that um, act functions as an excuse. And so if I can go back to Strassen's account of reactive attitudes, um, it's a, it's what he calls taking the objective view, you know, um, and taking the objective view is to not really excuse fully the, uh, the conduct of the person or the, the thing to whom you would otherwise have this reactive attitude, but to explain why it's inappropriate to have the reactive attitude. So for example, uh, it's inappropriate to resent small children because of sort of the uh, objective view where you take them as sort of a product of um, their environment and not fully cognizant or, or agential in, in key ways. Um, and I think that still applies uh, as a reason to be incoherent to the dehumanized because, again, the, uh, the dehumanized are treated in ways that sort of presuppose uh, reactive attitudes and, and moral agency in a way that we don't treat uh, predators like lions and tigers and bears. So a line from the essay that stuck with me is, there was no Auschwitz where we tortured actual rats, uh, even though um, there was an Auschwitz where uh, people who were regarded as rats were routinely tortured. Um, 
So the, the conduct is conducted in a way that uh, sort of assumes a moral agency that uh, predators don't have. So another question from Cheyenne, this was actually uh, directed toward uh, Sebastian, your last slide about the BLM slide. Uh, she asks, isn't there a lack of philosophical debate because the humanity is a priori? So there's nothing little to debate about? Um, the, the, the question is, um, let me see. There's a lack of philosophical debate, but isn't that because the humanity is a priori? Right, no, I, yeah, the, 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 there is philosophical debate, right? Like there's debate between, um, you know, racists giving arguments, um, you know, that, that deny the goals of the Black Lives Matter movement. And then there are like kind of like liberal humanist arguments, um, you know, in, in favor, you know, trying to, trying to win oppressed people in the club of humanity. Um, but that philosophical discussion is rendered pointless, like is rendered meaningless by, by the praxis of movements like Black Lives Matter. So there is debate, like, but I'm trying to say that the debate um, doesn't, have, doesn't have meaning because, uh, because like it's not, like, like, like it's not a serious, like, like the, the, the opposing view, like saying that they are not, that those lives don't matter, like is, is, can, is cannot be taken seriously philosophically. And so we shouldn't like, we don't need to do this like humanist thing of like entertaining and like putting forth reasons why people are human because they are and to say other, otherwise is like is totally discredited on multiple levels. And, and most importantly by like the, the material kind of praxis of like, yeah, like, you know, people like Malcolm X, um, you know, Black Lives Matter. Um, so that was, that's what I was saying with the last slide. Thank you. Uh, next, we have a question for Sam. Um, Chess Shire is asking for uh, everyday examples of abnegation. And I might also ask as, a, as an audience member myself, if you could reiterate the definition of abnegation uh, before you do so. So uh, abnegation, as I defined it, was the treatment of oneself as if one lacked agency or individuality or other supposedly distinctly human attributes. Uh, and while it seems like something that's really rare, it's actually far more common than you would think. Um, and the first example that I think uh, I, I went to that I think is probably not particularly um, uh, normal, but it is noteworthy, is the trial of Adolf Eichmann uh, in Jerusalem, where part of his defense was uh, stating that he was simply following the Führer principle in, in administering Auschwitz. And the Führer principle was that uh, you were to, to act in a way such that if Hitler were there, that he would approve of your conduct. So your uh, sort of, instead of following some sort of self-selected rule, you defer the question onto this um, imagined uh, uh, person who would choose for you. Um, much in the same way that, that Christine Korsgaard gives the example of Harriet and Emma, where Harriet um, routinely just defers to Emma on what to do and is uh, simply uh, following Emma's advice without really selecting any law upon which to act. Uh, perhaps slightly less, uh, but still quite controversial example would be um, the rhetoric which Vojislav Shashely gave uh, that was presented at his ICTY. Um, uh, trial in which he he was one of the trial uh, speeches which he gave which for which he was under um, investigation was one in which he said effectively that uh, the uh, the way in which the Croats were conducting the war against the Serbs forced him a Serbian's hand in a way that he was uh, going to ship them all back to Zagreb not in a way that was like because of his own decisions but simply because they had forced his hand. Uh, here, it's, it's as if uh, he's not really selecting the law upon which to, to act. He's just saying, you have made it such that I cannot act any other way. It's slightly different, but you, he was, in a way, attempting to deny his own agency in the matter by saying, external circumstances have forced my hand. Um, 
in a way that's perhaps less cleanly tied to abnegation, but still, I think, uh, or, or less cleanly tied to the Harriet and Emma example in the Course Guard paper, but nonetheless, uh, I think, constitutes abnegation because of the way in which he phrased them. Thank you. Um, Professor Bolton asks the question. This is, I think, open to anybody. If, in fact, if all of you would like to create a brief uh, response to it. Um, can microaggressions also be considered as a technique in dehumanization? And we'll just go to the speaking order if you all want to weigh in. I would need a specific example, I think, um, because I, I'm not particularly well versed in what constitutes a microaggression because there are a lot of different types of microaggressions. So perhaps the other two would have better answers. Yeah, so I looked up like the definition like on the internet, like Merriam-Webster's edition. It's essentially like the idea of unintentional um, things that cause, let me get the actual definition real fast. So a statement, action, or incident regarded as an instance of indirect, subtle, or unintentional discrimination against a, mar a member of a marginalized group. Um, I guess the main, the main paradox I was trying to highlight was epistemic in nature. So if the microaggression reveals sincerely held beliefs on behalf of the, the aggressor, then yes. Um, but otherwise, I don't think the epistemic um, discrepancy is um, present, and perhaps uh, there's more, there's just different moral reasons not to uh, uh, prefer that. Okay. How about you, Sebastian? Um, I'm trying to think back to uh, Smith's paper. I, you know, I could be making this up, but I think I read something about read something about uh, read, read something he wrote about like you know, even children being able to like accidentally sort of, or like, you know, not maliciously dehumanize. So I wouldn't, I, maybe it's included in his accounts that you could, yeah, do microaggressions. I mean, according to my, my thing, right? Like my thing is that like microaggressions are like unintentional uh, in, in the sense that like everything is sort of determined. Like, you know, we live in a, you know, say we're talking about like transphobic microaggressions, like we live in like a hegemonically, you know, patriarchal society. And so those kinds of dispositions are going to be induced, um, unfortunately, by, uh, you know, are going to be induced by, by the structure of society. And it's not like a, not like a psycho, like a psychological drama of like, you know, we, we think of trans people as humans, or that then, you know, there's like this dehumanizing thing that this dehumanizing thing that happens, but rather we live in like, an, we have an oppressive like social situation um, that itself instantiates um, those those views uh, a priori, and then they come out. Um, even if there's like you know countervailing forces, um, you know, progressive forces advocating for uh, you know for, for them to be uh, advocating like, against like say transphobia in this example. But I agree with I agree with Sam. I think it would depend on the example. I'm not as a I'm not as well versed on the on the on the edge cases, I guess, as I should be. Thank you. And uh, anything to add, Ethan? Uh, yeah, um, I would say that I don't know if I would on I, I don't know if I would broad. No, I think I would broadly say that, yeah, microaggressions probably can be um, a a technique for dehumanization in that they reflect kind of some of the unconscious feelings about you know, how one group feels about another group um, through interaction. Uh, I think they are definitely a technique, but I don't think they're one of the most upfront techniques, if that makes sense. Because much of the rhetoric that surrounds dehumanization uh, and things like that is, most of it is usually very upfront and very um, almost potent and in your face. And microaggressions are kind of different in that they're, you know, much more subtle, uh, much kind of harder to catch if you're not really cognizant of them. Um, so I think they are a technique, but I don't think they're the major technique. I would say they probably play a smaller role in my mind, at least. Thank you for that, guys. Uh, I have another question from Cheshire uh, for Sebastian, um, wondering whether you see any value in having 
universal humanism as a political ideal? Um, I think that we all know because I, I think that there is a, a big history of, you know, human, the kind of like humanism and like human rights ideology being used, um, like instrumentalized in like an oppressive way, as I kind of briefly touched on. You know, like modern examples could be the way like the US treats other countries. Um, a lot of, you know, a lot of like sanctions and even like wars and invasions are based on this, like on, on the kind of the liberal humanist idea of human rights. Like, you know, why did we, you know, why did we, uh, you know, attack Libya or why did we attack Syria was the reason that we were given. It was, you know, human rights, like to save human rights for one group or another. Um, you know, why are, are we giving deadly sanctions to North Korea? You know, why is there an increasing ramp up of aggression against China? It's because, I mean, part of the ideological justification and, and build up for a conflict is often human rights. So like, I don't know, I, I, I think that there, it can be like, I can I think it can be like kind of like progressive like expressions of that, like saying housing is a human right or healthcare is a human right. Like, I think that's, I mean, that's, it's better that that exists than doesn't, but on the whole, I, I know that like a lot of, uh, a lot of oppression uh, internationally and, uh, you know, even yeah here has been based on human rights and in the name of, of humanism and human rights. So I, I would disagree. I, I think that you need a new radical theory um, that comes from radical praxis that might not even preserve the human subject, you know, like maybe we don't even have uh, the, the human as like the subject of history anymore, given the kind of problematic uh, nature of its birth, um, you know, but I think just, I mean, I'm not like, you know, I'm not like uh, in love with that idea necessarily, but I think that we need to move beyond uh, this, this sort of like really Eurocentric uh, Western idea of humans and what it means to be human and the kind of treatment that humans deserve in, in virtue of their humanity. So if yeah, that answers the question. Thank you for that. Ethan, uh, I have a question from Professor Calhoun asking if you're actually just revising Smith's notion of dehumanization because the Uyghurs are represented as dangerous, violent terrorists, but not as animals. Um, I would say that given what I've provided, I may be revising it a little bit, but I wouldn't commit to revising it. And when I say I don't commit to revising it, I mean that given a lot of the rhetoric and kind of the general like stance toward the Uyghur people in China, a lot of that is obviously not really accessible to me and that I don't, you know, I can't, I can't read Chinese. I, I, a lot of the news sources are, you know, just I, in places of the internet, I don't even know how to get to. Um, so I think given what I have, I think it's, you know, appropriate to say it needs to be revised a little bit in that there's maybe not as direct comparisons being made to animals, but I think we do still see the comparisons being made to, you know, diseases and, you know, being violent and uh, being extremists. And also uh, something that I was reminded of was, I think, I think about a month ago now, the Chinese embassy on Twitter, like the official account of the Chinese government, uh, one of their official accounts at least, uh, tweeted something that said, uh, and I quote, studies show that in the process of eradicating extremism, the minds of Uyghur women in Xinjiang were emancipated and gender equality and reproductive health were promoted, making them no longer baby making machines. They are confident and independent. Uh, they were, you know, this account was suspended for that post by Twitter. But I think that in and of itself shows that they are being seen as, you know, machines, baby making machines. They're being dehumanized, maybe not necessarily as animalistically, but I think the rhetoric definitely does show that they are being dehumanized. And I think under most of Smith's account, it still lines up given, uh, you know, the, the disease part and the, the violent part and the just general objectification. Thank you, Ethan. Um, I have a question for Sam. I'm wondering if uh, what you've described as self dehumanization can be saved from incoherence if we accept the notion that the self is different than the body so that you can, I guess, perhaps allow yourself to endure even extreme pain, um, but not dehumanize yourself uh, because the body is somehow different than uh, the soul or the full human in itself. Yeah, actually, the uh, 
person I cited, Ernst Jünger, makes a similar type of claim in that um, he argues that the uh, the sacrifice of the body needs to have some sort of, uh, he calls it a command post behind it. But obviously, uh, he's writing from the context of being a veteran. Uh, he was like shot nine times during World War One. Um, trying to find it in my paper. Uh, so the the problem with that is that um, it's there's still questions of agency. Um, who is willing it? Uh, these types of things uh, it need to be uh, clarified. If it's the individual willing his body to be treated as a mere object, uh, the question still remains. Um, then what is it that's uh, willing the the dehumanization or or the uh, the objectification? And if it's the individual himself, then then uh, why is it that this type of objectification still requires the the uh, losing the capacity to will? Um, so even if if you try to make the sort of body mind distinction, the worry is that what the objectification entails is um, trying to get rid of a, I guess, a mental uh, part of the person, which is uh, the capacity to will. Thank you. Uh, I'm going to, we have a political question. I'm going to try and rephrase it into a political psycho uh, like philosophy question from Nicole. And she was asking, what can the United, United States do to punish the treatment of the Uyghur, uh, the Chinese treatment of the Uyghurs? I'm going to change it a little bit to make it more philosophical. And I'm actually going to ask Sebastian this because you talked about how America actually goes, uh, you know, and enforces our policies of humanism on other countries. Do you think the United States would be justified in going out and punishing or reprimanding China for their atrocities against the Uyghurs? No, um, I guess not least because I guess I disagree um, with the, like, I guess the empirical evidence or the what was like presented as evidence like i don't i don't think that like western like news organizations like the bbc or the ap are like really reliable in talking about third world countries given the history like i said of you know them lying about iraq lying about vietnam like you know lying about cuba to get us into war with cuba like i i there's an i don't I mean, a lot of the evidence is traced back to like you know a couple of ngos and like adrian zen's um so I don't think that, so that's the first thing, right? Like I, I dispute the specificity of the facts. And second of all, I don't know, it's just really chauvinist, like Western chauvinist to be talking about like punishing countries, you know, like uh, what gives the US, which is a country that is like founded on the genocide of Native Americans and the slavery and ongoing genocide of black people. Um, what gives them the right to punish anyone, any other nation? Um, it's, uh, I don't know, I, I find that repulsive. Uh, you know, I know it's like normatively laden, but I, I don't know. It, it, it offends me, um, and I, I guess the answer is no. Like, I don't think, uh, first of all, that uh, China is being treated fairly. Like any country that's against the U.S. that it was like you know countervailing their hegemony, I don't think China is being treated fairly. Uh, you know, by uh, the media and by you know the by the international community, they mean like Western Europe, the United States, Australia, and New Zealand. Um, you know, and, and second of all, I don't think the U.S. has the right to, the, the moral standing to, like, punish anyone for, especially for genocide, given our history and our unrepentant history. Um, no, so that's my, that's my answer. That's fair. A quick follow-up, just, just so I understand your point. Do you think anyone would be justified in trying to, if, let's assume that they're true, right? Let's assume that these atrocities that are that are being reported are true right do you think anyone would be justified in trying to alleviate those i mean yeah like in this like hypothetical thing where like bad things were happening and there's like i don't know there's also like assumptions that like you know there's like it's like fallacious to think that like sanctions or like invasions i mean that, that only like affects regular people like as you has been demonstrated by iran um, and like other countries that have been sanctioned by the u.s like it just stars people and deprives them of medicine uh iraq is a great example like i don't i don't agree with like the actions of like the bathist state under saddam hussein 
but uh, it's pretty clear that the sanctions, you know, ultimately only affected Iraqis and the U.S. knew, uh, and Britain and France knew, um, and uh, so no, I don't. Uh, sanctions kill. Uh, you know, hands off China. Hands off all those countries. Like we have no standing to do that. Do anything to make any kind of judgment, especially given the atrocities happening here that we actually can do something about. Um, yeah, I don't know. I, I, I just I disagree with like the premise and um, I guess yeah if there was like some like the magical thing where like <laughs> where like there's a bad thing happening and like it could only have unequivocally good outcomes then I guess I would support it <laughs> but um, I I dispute that uh, that's the real motive of sanctions I think they're about disciplining punishing the third world for disobedience and that's been demonstrated over and over again but um, that's just that's just my view right. Um, but yeah, I guess that's, to answer it, it's convoluted, but yeah. I appreciate that. Thank you. I'd like to pass the same question on to Sam, who perhaps uh, more is more intimately acquainted with this topic about what can or should be done by the United States or by other countries in response to this genocide in China. Uh, did you mean me or did you mean Ethan? Oh, I, I meant Ethan. I apologize. Um, well, yeah, so like I've heard of a lot of people like kind of disputing whether or not it's happening. I mean, based on like hard evidence, drone footage, like satellite photos, like I think it's pretty obvious it's happening. Um, I mean, like you can dispute that if you want, but like given, let's just assume that it is happening. Um, I mean, I don't know. I feel like the United States government is, is pretty justified in trying to curtail China. I mean, like, sure, I would say the United States government is not a, a moral actor but i would say no state is a moral actor because states inherently just are not moral actors they they kind of have to kind of sacrifice morality in that regard they have to kind of be hard utilitarian um and i think in that light like i don't know i i feel like while it is easy to say that like you know states shouldn't interfere with other states people should get their sovereignty and autonomy we've made you know mistakes in the past things aren't always going to turn out the way we want them to I think it's also important to take responsibility for certain things, right? I mean, uh, just allowing atrocities like this to happen, like we've seen before that if like nobody steps in at the start, then like nobody steps in at all. Look at the Rwandan genocide, that kind of just happened. I mean, there were UN peacekeepers on the ground in Rwanda that didn't do anything because they weren't sure if they had like, you know, the clearance to like fight back or like protect people, right? Um, and I think being indecisive on things like this is, I think it is it's harmful to the people who are actively suffering. Um, and while I'm I'm not advocating like we go to war with China or anything, I think that's completely unrealistic. I think it is important to kind of highlight this problem, uh, and to put pressure on the Chinese government. I mean, we stopped buying their cotton, which they're you know, I think it's 84% of China's cotton exports come from Xinjiang specifically, and there's pretty like decent evidence that like Uyghur people are being forced to pick cotton. Uh, for the Chinese government. So I think given things like that, we can kind of, I think the best thing to do to greet this problem is to move away from China, right? And when I say that, I mean, economic inter interdependence between America and China. I think America should kind of maybe try to steer away from that and engage, you know, the rest of Southeast Asia or Asia or Europe or whatever, Africa. But I think in order to kind of actually put any real pressure on the Chinese government, trade is going to have to kind of take us uh you know a sideline but i don't think any well, either of the governments are really going to be willing to do that to be honest thank you uh we're out of actual questions from the attendees but i have one quick question um and this is actually for you sam the question i have is is it ever justified to like demonize somebody maybe not a group i don't i don't agree with applying like dehumanizing qualities to an entire group of people but let's say someone does something and proves right like beyond a reasonable doubt that they're probably not a very good person can you demonize that person or is that unjustified like if they commit a child murder on like 47 orphans can you dehumanize that person or do you have to treat them like you would any other person so there's a couple ways that i could parse that question uh, whether there's an epistemic justification, uh, whether there's a moral justification, or whether there's some sort of practical justification. Um, and I'd, I'd say the, the reason why we hold people like child murderers 
in such repugnant contempt is precisely because they are human and they chose like there's some sort of agency or 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 personhood about them that makes them morally culpable in a way that uh for example a wild animal killing a child uh isn't culpable and so the demonization would perhaps be more counter uh in or counterproductive than it would be helpful in terms of holding that person accountable or preventing that person from committing further atrocities. So the the uh, f from an epistemic point, obviously, no, because you shouldn't treat humans like non-humans because that's just epistemically inaccurate. Um, from a moral perspective, part of holding someone in resentment is acknowledging that they are the correct type of thing to hold resentment towards. And so uh, the, I guess, like a Strassonian account would say, precisely because this person is a human who committed child murder is why resentment is, is applicable. If it were you know, a non-human, then it would not be applicable. So uh, I don't think on a Strassonian view you could get to this uh, account where you can demonize even child murders. Thank you. Okay, so if that is it, um, then we are going to go ahead and close the event. Thank you guys so much. Um, and thank you to our audience for asking all of the questions. Um, it was a great event. And um, uh, thank you so much to Shippers for allowing us to host it. We will see you all next time. Thank you all for coming out and have a good rest of your evening. Thank you. Have a good one.